Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Spirituality Adventures. Thanks for joining in. We are interviewing Brian Sumner today. And um, Brian actually is a guy who Matt Cox, our, our people know Matt Cox, Brian, my, my videographer, producer. And uh, he followed you when you were in your skate career wow. and uh, connected with you back then. And so uh, he was like, going, I think you should you should get a hold of Brian Sumner and do an interview with Brian. I said, I'd, I'd love to. Let's do it. So thanks for joining us. Of course. I'm excited. And I just got a disclaim. I've had a runny nose, been sick. If I sound funky, forgive me, you guys. But um, I'm excited to be with you guys. First people I've spoke to in about three or four days, it feels like. So amen. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, as well for, for hooking it up. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, give us, uh, you know, a lot of people won't know your story. So give yeah. us uh, where where you're born. Yep. Uh, give us your backstory. What, yeah. how, what brought you to America? All that kind of stuff. Well, I grew up in a city, a very famous city, where my mom and my dad used to go to this place called the Cavern. And they used to watch a band play called the Beatles. So I'm from Liverpool, you know, the greatest football team ever, not soccer, football, folks listening, especially in Kansas, right. that thing you throw around, it's like a loaf of bread. That's not football. That's yeah, handball. I mean, yeah. They're yeah. thinking you're talking about, you know, Patrick Mahomes. No. You talk football. In football, you actually <laughs> use your foot to kick the ball. It's football. The truth set you free. The whole rest of the world thinks that way, right? But we Americans, we make up our own things, right? Well, you drive on the wrong, well, we, we, we drive on the wrong side of the road now. Um, we speak with an accent. I mean, listen, if anyone is listening from Liverpool, they're going to say he wants to be an American. <laughs> the Americans are like, what does this guy sound like? But yeah, I, I was born and raised in Liverpool, England, you know, beautiful city. I mean, but still crazy. A lot of unemployment. It's a dock city right there on the river. Did a lot of trade with New York, Ireland, the world. Um, grew up playing football, just being a regular kid. Fell in love with skateboarding, you know, I mean, I, I still can't believe you, you said you're, you're the age you are. I mean, like I said, you have the best filter. I mean, amen. Um, but I grew up watching a movie. You've definitely watched the whole series, Police Academy 4. Um, <laughs> and in that film was skateboarding. David Spade, Tony Hawk. I'm a little book tooth kid. See that movie. Think skateboarding is like a Hollywood stunt. Fall in love with it. Get a skateboard within a few months on vacation in New Jersey, <laughs> in New Jersey. Um, go back to Liverpool and all I do is skate every day for the next year or two and within a year or two again magazines videos getting noticed and um, having this big career that's kind of where my life goes so yeah whatever you want to take it from there <laughs> well so I'm curious like you how old were you when you went back to Liverpool and mm -hmm. dove into the skateboard culture well, well so you know and what was the culture like in Liverpool for yeah. skateboarding so, you know, How old were you? Well, you know, picture being, like I said, I probably was watching police. Like I said to you earlier, you know, you're, 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 what's arriving in Liverpool is the Simpsons, the WWF, Married with Children, Police Academy. I mean, it was huge in Europe. You know, I heard Australia. So I'm watching this, seeing skateboarding. My sisters who were seven or eight years older moved to America to Nanny for, you know, like, I think it was like Danny DeVito or Rod Stewart or these people like the East Coast. There's Brian, never been to America, watching these American films. I want to visit. So I land in New Jersey, you know, of all places, I've got Jersey pride. Me and Bruce Springsteen, I mean, never met the guy, but I know what he's, he's believing in. And I love America. Like I said, going into 7-Eleven, just the coast, just the sidewalks, and go back to Liverpool. And then... Within two years, you know, I'm suddenly sponsored. I get to go to America. How old are you? I'm 15, 16. And here's what's funny, because I know you guys are going to think this. You finish school in England when you're 15 or 16. So I literally finished school, 
go to art school for six months. I'm starting to get noticed, get a phone call from, you know, Tony Hawk's company. Hey, do you want to come over here and start working on being an amateur, doing things? A couple of English companies that sponsored me too, helped me get over there. So I'm landing in America at what, 16, 16 and a half. Um, outside it's beautiful and sunny, skating around, making a couple hundred dollars a month in an apartment with a couple of guys. That was it. I mean, that's all I've known. So I spent more time in America than I have in England now, you know, yeah. 42, so. Wow, what was, was there a skate culture in Liverpool? Oh yeah, it, it, honestly, it is it is beautiful. And I rarely use that word like that specifically, like I, I'll help understand, you know, let's say we're all going to school, all three of us. Now we're 12, 13, guess what? Your brother's doing drugs and your sister's doing this. We're going to raves, we're doing ecstasy. This is what everything around us is. The Doors movie, it came out, there's a heavy influence you know this all you're talking about your past even and being a part of the church for so many years culture has such an influence on us yes the beatles make amazing music hey pink floyd bob marley all the rest of it the 60s 70s but what's deeper wound into that is the drug use and the sleeping around and the partying and those things infiltrate the mind i mean we're flesh we want to do things you know what i mean but i'm this kid skate culture I'm about to jump into skate culture, but all my friends around me, they're starting to say, am I the guy who takes acid? Am I the guy who parties? There's Brian in school, loving Bruce Lee, doing martial arts, not wanting to do any of this. Skate culture shows up. None of those kids, for whatever reason, partied, raged, anything crazy. I go into the city center. I meet like 50, 60 people from the age, like 35 to like my age. Mm -hmm. I would go in every night after school, two or three hours all over the city. That became my friends, older men, and um, a few women, but people that just took you everywhere. Amazing architecture and um, granite, marble. I mean, hundreds of years of, you know, architecture. That just became a playground for us. You get the train in, you're going around, like I said, hours and hours, it's beautiful. Um, and then, yeah, you get sponsored, you come to America. We've all been reading the magazines, we've all been in the videos, seeing all the rest of it. Now there's a whole new culture. Skating is like a religion. You and I were seeing what was happening every month as the magazine came out, hearing the names of the top guys, that became our family. Like for Matt, even right now, I can just say things like that. He'll know the song, he'll know the trick. It's a religion. It's like football to people, you know, or sure. MMA. So yeah. the family. They're into. So were you in, I'm just curious in Liverpool, were you skating in skate parks or did you just create your own skate places wherever you went? Oh, it's all there. I mean, the stairs, the rails, the, the sidewalks. Just, oh, just made it up. Just I know created a, few, a few parks, but I didn't care about it. I, yeah. you know, ramps and that, I was more into grinder handrail, skate that ledge, the sound of it, you know, mm -hmm. all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then when you, it was a Tony Hawk's group that recruited you to, to move well, to Huntington I, well, I Beach? I friend, Jeff Rowley, that I grew up with. Like, I mean, as far as he was the first skater I really like looked up to in Liverpool, he helped me get like get over to America where he was a part of a company flip and he was like, Hey, you know, they're looking for amateurs. Basically. Why don't you come over? They were giving me stuff. But while I was there, I met, you know, Andrew Reynolds, Willie Santos, Jeremy Klein. They were all part of the same crew of people, same businesses basically. And when I came back, flip was like, yeah, maybe we won't do something. And Birdhouse was like, Oh, we want to sponsor you right away, fly you back, put you up all the rest of it. So, I pretty much landed in America, which, you know, Matt could, will, will be, he knows this, but it is crazy looking back. We're all amateurs. It's me, Andrew Reynolds, Jim Greco, you know, Ali Bulala, all these people today who are like profound, infamous skaters because they've been in culture for so long. If anything, I'm more like the Sasquatch guy who kind of backed away a few years ago and was like, I'm working on a bunch of other stuff, but we didn't know what was happening. You know, our, our days were, if it's us three, you know, we're waking up at 12 o'clock in the mor in the morning. I mean, like, you know, in the afternoon. I'm going to go eat Taco Bell. We're going to yeah. go sit in a jacuzzi. And then we're going to go skate for six and seven hours. And your friend's the photographer. My friend's the filmer. Goes to the magazines. Every month it's coming out. And so now you're getting paid. You're getting paid for royalties. And now you become a professional. And you start making... I mean, I went from making, you know, 450 bucks a month, which I just... They're paying for your apartment anyway. I don't drive. To now you're a professional where you can make ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars a month guaranteed contracts for like three years. It's crazy. So yeah.
Yeah. And you're 16. 16. So by the so, time I'm 17, 18, that's when yeah. you're making that much money. But right. the benefit of riding for Tony Hawk, and you've got to remember this, because even, even for you, what you would have seen at that age, even when you're pastoring and the rest of it, you would have seen skating was huge in the 70s, slowed down. Then it got bigger in the 80s, slowed down. The 90s hits, early 2000s, it blew up. So now mm -hmm. you have all these malls and they're filling it. You know, Vans was always relevant, but it wasn't taken on Nike and Adidas and Reebok. It all blew up. And now I'm going around the world with Tony Hawk. And so this, think about this. This English guy with funny hair, black hair, who's like 160, wears all black, is on TV, on ESPN every week. Every kid that skates is going to know who that person is because he sounds way crazy than I do now. He's doing all these tricks and he's riding with these guys. And it just allowed me to have a platform that I didn't realize what was happening. But, you know, praise God, I got to make it over here and make some money and become a citizen, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Did, did your parents come with you? Did, no, no. no. <laughs> and I have the most amazing parents. Like they, they, they trusted me. But here's why. I grew up doing martial arts, which is a discipline. I played football. I was disciplined. Um, the, the Bruce Lee obsession, Bruce rarely drunk, rarely got high. He had a disciplined life. So I had to go around the country with older people. This is at 13, 14, 15. By the time I'm 16, it's a family. Oh, you're going to Huntington Beach to be with more people like this. And Jeff was already over there. So... To this day, I mean, my kids, you know, 21, he only moved out two years ago. That was early to me. I was living in America at 16, 17. Crazy, you know, yeah. going all over. I mean, going to Vietnam, going to China. I mean, I went, I went to Vietnam for like two weeks when I was 16, and they'd never seen skateboards. It was wow. insane. Wow. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the police they'd, came out and stopped they'd, traffic. They'd seen, uh, they'd seen soccer balls, footballs, but they hadn't seen skateboards, right? <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, and even Americans, there was a guy with us from Egypt, there was a guy who was Mexican, and there was me, and of all the people, they would stop you, you know, you pull up to the airport everyone's got white shirts on on bikes and they would just grab your hair as you're, you're in oh. a crowd of like 30 people yeah. on a bike and they would just stroke and my friend who was Mexican he had the biggest eyes yeah. and the craziest hair and they would all want to take photos with him yeah it was beautiful to see yeah yeah you know I my when I first started going to Ethiopia my hair wow. was a lot longer and like when I'm in the sun it, it still will bleach out and yeah. like the kids, I'd go in these villages and the kids all want to touch your hair. They want to touch your skin, your arms. You know, it's just. It's crazy though. It's, kind of, think it's about kind of fun. It. It's yeah. fun though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fun stuff. Well, um, so I'm just. So, golly, that's so cool. So your parents, do they still live in Liverpool? Well, my mom had passed away a few years ago, but my okay. dad does. And I just, yeah, talked to him, you know, two days ago, yeah. trying to get over there. Both my sister's all my family so all still live there all of them all yeah. of them wow yeah. interesting so um so tell me about your faith background like what yeah. was what was your family was your family like most people in england yeah. don't go to church but they might get married in church and buried in church right yeah yeah and you know this <clears throat> is shocking for americans to hear but i did not meet one christian my whole life so I have a lot of Muslim friends, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormon, but I never met a Christian in a sense of like, here's what the Bible is about or the gospel. I live five doors down from a humongous church. I mean, if I'm correct, I think Charles Darwin is on our money. So as I'm growing up, I'm just like, hey, we evolved and we call it evolution. That's how we say it, that, you know, evolution. It sounds like we're saying evolution, but it's like, okay, this is what life's like. We had a Bible in one of the bookshelves in the house that I never opened. My mom said she was Protestant, my dad said she was Catholic, but I'd never been in a church. I'd never been to a wedding even. So to me, it was just like, I have no clue about this, who Charles Spurgeon is, who J.C. Ryle is, you know, Martin Lloyd-Jones, no idea. And the church was viewed as, this is this old dudes in skirts with like, you know, bald heads that like want your money and mess around with kids. And I mean, that was, it's, you know, it's an institution. It's just a man-made thing. It ne and I say that to say, if we were sitting by a campfire tonight, listening to the Get Up Kids, and you were saying, let's have a conversation about something, it would probably be about, are Ouija boards real? 
you know, is God real? Is Bigfoot real? Are UFOs real? That's the extent of like, God is thrown in with just like these random ideas. It's it's so post-Christian to me that I'd never thought about it. Mm-hmm. Religion. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's, I mean, my whole experience in Europe, you know, I've, 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 I've yeah, been traveled in the world, Switzerland. Yeah. I've been all over Europe and uh, yeah, that's definitely, um, definitely a post-Christian experience. People look at you like you're crazy. If you were like, I'm a Christian, I'd be like, what is that? Yeah. I, would, I believe yeah. in God. What do you mean? Like maybe mm-hmm. he's real, but how can right. you know? Yeah. Yeah, I've I've had hundreds and hundreds of conversations with people about spiritual things and God yeah. and Bible and all that in in Europe, you know. Yeah. In yeah. England, in Switzerland, Switzerland, and England are the two main places that I Yeah. I did a lot of lot of work in, but uh, mm. yeah, kind of fun. <laughs> Yeah, no, I always loved it though. I always love, I always, I still love having conversations with people all over the spiritual map outside the box yes. because yeah. I just find it fascinating. Yeah. And I find even in England, like I would have friends who, who were pastors and in the church and they were, they didn't want to talk to anybody in England about Jesus yeah. or spiritual yeah. things because they just thought they'd be frowned upon. Yeah. And I don't know if it was because I was American and had a different accent. Yeah. But I, people would always, well, why are you here? And I'd start telling them and they'd start asking me questions and they, they seemed completely fascinated with the topic. I know. I know. And it's like, they weren't blocked. They weren't, they weren't, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. It was just like, we had the greatest conversations. Well, and, uh, people like to talk, like, I, I can see with me. So I imagine as soon as they open up to you, they want to ask you questions. Sure. What do you believe? I mean, I know my mom would have loved those conversations with people, but yeah, I never heard one. It was yeah. like, it's, it's so thought. interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, um, so how did, why, how in the world did you get uh, connected to Jesus? Well, you know, so fell in love with skating at 13. Now I'm 19. I'm in America. Fall in love again. I always joke, you know, this time it's with an American who drives on the wrong side of the road, you know, speaks with an accent and dares to call, you know, football, soccer. We fell madly in love, you know, a lady called Tracy so there's money coming in, I'm touring the world, you're in the magazines, and, and you have enough amount of a fame in the thing you like. It's like you being a really good guitarist and people know you've put your time in. So when you get in circles, it's great that you kind of have this affirmation like, man, my life's moving forward, but you don't really care about anything else. So skating in my bubble, everything was good. I was basically gaining the whole world, but still losing my soul. Now I meet this woman, we're madly in love. I've never really faced that many challenges. My parents were great. Yeah, I got in fights as a kid, never something tragic. And so I'm just like, hey, next step in my life, love this girl, been together for four months. I'm about to go back to England. You know what? I don't want to go back without her. Let's get married. Drive down to the pier, Huntington Beach. I can't even drive yet. I'd never drove in England. So, you know, I'm, I'm 19 by now. I've never needed to drive. I'm always in your car or, you know, whoever's car taking me skating. We're together every day for four months, drive down to the pier, ask her to marry me, drive out to Vegas the next day, get married, tell no one, tell Jeff Rowley and his girlfriend at the time, Christine Todd, don't tell our parents because my family are gonna be like, what are you doing, you didn't invite us. Her parents are gonna be like, you guys are nuts, don't do this. Now we're pregnant, now we're on top of the world. We've um, living with her parents, hadn't bought a house yet, beautiful baby boy two or three years of marriage, without God, without faith, no clue about anything, um, fighting like crazy, maybe you're the wrong one, we didn't live happily ever after. You know, I loved the way she looked, made me feel, all the things she did for me, really just loving myself, which is typical, you know, oh, I gotta have this drink, gotta have this style, gotta go this place, it's a comfort life. Within a year of that, we're divorced, and then I literally said, you know what, and, and this is all back to the whole Bruce Lee thing, I read all these philosophy books when I was eight, nine, 10, 11. I just fell in love with philosophy for whatever reason. And then Bruce wrote these books that kind of hit him in England around that time. And his whole thing is what Kung Fu is, is deconstructing everything to get to the truth. And he said, it's like a sculptor that tear, tears away at the clay until the truth is revealed. So in skating, I was getting rid of all the chaff till the way a trick worked, worked. You do it in business, you do it in life, do it writing a book, you take it down to the skeleton. Everything in my life could be dealt with with that. But now in my marriage, I was done. I couldn't fix this. 
and it was maybe it was the OCD, maybe it was the ex- perfectionist side of me, you know, most men. And so I remember just saying, you know what? And I don't know why I said it. I said, you know what, God? And I looked up. I'm going to prove you're not real because if you're not real, nothing matters. And the thought was simply this. And it went back to those Bruce Lee ideas, you know, Lao Tzu, Dowder Jeng, I mean, Rana Krishnamurti, all these guys I was reading at the time. Liverpool's very eclectic. If we go downtown today, you will run into Muslim, I mean, Muslims, Buddhists, uh, Muslims, Hindus, and they'll all have conversations with you. New Age is huge there. It's blowing up. So I figured either I was created or I wasn't. I was created, where's the evidence? If I wasn't, I'm just roadkill. Who cares about your podcast? Who cares about Liverpool? Who cares about mom and dad? Who cares who's the president? Who cares about Russia, the Ukraine? I'm just roadkill, whatever. And from (laughs) that journey, I said, let's look at all the different faiths, Buddhism, Hinduism, all the different things. And it was the Bible that I opened that grabbed a hold of me, sent me on a seven month journey I mean, you know, God makes some radical claims right there in Genesis. You know, did Moses record these? Jesus said he did. Open up Genesis 1. Let us make man in our image. Okay, God, first question. I'm angry. I mean, I've got marks on my body where I was angry. If I lived in Texas, I wouldn't be alive today. If I had access to guns, I wouldn't be alive today. You know, so I opened up Genesis. If I'm made in your image, God, why does my life suck? Why am I divorced? Why am I suicidal? I've got money, I could chase women, I could do whatever. But, and it wasn't just the marriage, it was this idea of truth. And what did I do from Genesis 1? God dealt with me. Well, Brian, I put Adam and Eve in the garden. That's what the scripture tells us. But I told them, in the day you eat of this tree, you will die. They died spiritually, we all die physically. Okay, I'd never heard that before. What did God do? He began to pursue Adam. Adam was hiding from God. God asked Adam, where are you, Adam? God knew where he was, but man didn't know where he was. As I continue reading, God shows up to Abraham. Through you, I'm going to bless the world. How? Through a seed, through a promise that's going to arrive thousands of years later. David, Moses, we get Exodus 20, all the commandments. Guilty. I've lied. I've lusted. All the rest of it. All the way. And here's what's funny. You'll get a kick out of this. I'm probably 220 right now and I like it because I'm a purple belt in jiu-jitsu. I don't want to get smashed by everyone. I want to smash people. But picture back then, and Matt can say this, being a vegan. Picture being a vegan reading the Old Testament. (laughs) Every year, exactly, every year because you and I are in sin, he's going to take the lamb. And it's funny, I don't know why my wife has this sitting up here. Going to take the lamb, it was a gift from someone, and shred it to pieces. As a vegan, I'm like, this is barbaric. I'm reading the Bible, I'm looking up the words in the Hebrew, but I don't want this to be real. Every year that the lambs shed, every year the scapegoats put outside the city, I mean the doors shed above the doorposts, I'm reading all this as nonsense, you know, and testicles are squashed and 900 year old people and Leviathan and dinosaurs and just why are people wiped out? Well, there was a promise to Abraham. Terrorists were opposing him, people in opposition of Israel. Now I get to the New Testament, Here's John the Baptist, spirit of Elijah. Behold the Lamb of God. Wait a minute. Are you saying thousands of years of prophecy from Genesis 3, someone crushing the serpent's head is pointing to this potential Jewish carpenter? Are you saying that Jesus is the word that was always spoken, that the word became flesh, John 1, 14? Are you saying that him dying outside the city like the scapegoat is a picture of this? Are you say So this is blowing my mind because again, I'm in America trying to enjoy life and I don't want to go party with everyone. I don't want to run around and sleep with everyone. I just want to make some money, have a family, live my life. And I'm asking God, why is it all over the place? And here's this book and here's the point. I was going to God to fix my life, but God was coming to me to deal with an issue. And the issue was, I'm separated from God. The issue was, 100% of people, aside from Enoch and Elijah, are going to die, and they're going to have to die at some time. I mean, they got raptured out of here, you know? Enoch in the Old Testament, and Elijah a little bit later in the Old Testament. There's me, an unbeliever, trying to disprove the Bible, going to his word. It's on God to prove it to me. Get to the New Testament, and I heard how. You can know a lot about God. You can know the Hebrew and the Greek. Satan knows everything he can ever know about God to some degree, but isn't revealed. But you don't always know God. That was where I was. I was reading this. And then I read in John 3 how a man called Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, hey, I see what you're doing. And Jesus says, no, you don't. You can't see this kingdom unless you're born again. I was spiritually dead. 
I bought this house. I was still divorced from my wife. I literally, the guy talking right now that you're listening to, I literally thought by the time my son's five, six or seven, he'll have heard me say I love him enough times. I'll have done enough things for him. If I want to take my life then as roadkill, you know what? That's just how sad it is. That was the state of my life. But reading John 3, reading Matthew 7, after Jesus gives this beautiful picture in the Beatitudes and calls people to spiritually follow him, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, meaning those who will come to faith. And then he draws a line, but many will call me Lord, the curios depart from me. I'm saying, wait a minute, there's many that call you Lord, but don't know you. The Bible was answering so many things. Then hearing Jesus say to Peter, who do you say that I am? You're the Messiah. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father in heaven, I understood at the time of buying this house, wait a minute, I was going to God for my reasons, but I'm spiritually dead. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory. Why do we die? Because of sin. Because there's a curse on our body. We are aging right now, whether we're 61 or 42 like me, the sickness of the last few days, the passing of my mom, the people who miscarried today. It's all because of the curse on this world. I'd never heard this. And coming home to that house that night, after being on probation, having community service in a Christian thrift store, I got down on my face and said, God, and it was like, I knew I'd sinned, I needed forgiveness, why? Because the lamb was shed its blood, the scapegoat was put outside the city, Jesus went to that cross, the Bible claims for my sins that his blood can atone for them, never heard this. Got down on my face, 12 at night, after fighting with my ex-wife like crazy that day, and I got on the floor and said, God, and I said, Yahweh, I don't know if that's how you say it, Yehovah, the Tetragrammaton. I remember looking up and saying, I'm talking to you, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I was being literal. God knew everything. I'm going to prove you're not real. And at that time, though, I said, God, I need forgiveness. That was it. I didn't care about skating, about America, about my wife and my son. I knew that I was a sinner and I believed what the Bible said. And like Daniel says, some will be raised to everlasting judgment or just to everlasting righteousness or contempt. I believe those words. Jesus affirmed what Daniel said in the New Testament. And while I'm there, I had the most radical encounter scientifically to me that is subjective to everyone. Give you my life, lay down my life. I'll get baptized. I'll give you my skating. I'll remarry this woman. Those listening who are skeptical, when I'm sharing this in front of thousands of people on my knees, it was like in one instant, this Bruce Lee mindset, this guy on the floor crying out to God. It was like I knew the presence of God, whether you say it's the Holy Spirit arriving, him opening my eyes. He did for me what he talked about to Nicodemus. He did for me what he did for Peter. Flesh and blood cannot do this to you, but my Father in heaven. I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I was forgiven and I was laughing and crying in a room that's 20 feet away from me. I bought this house. I sat there for 40 minutes saying, I cannot believe this was real. In one instant, all the things I'd read, all the mindsets I'd had about philosophy and everything, it was just done. I just knew. And it was just like, it, my eyes were open. There was nothing. Like they said, to where else can we go, Lord? I came into this room. My ex-wife was here sleeping with my son next, on this bed, different bed, but right where I'm pointing right now. She sits up like a zombie, doesn't speak as much as me. You can probably tell. And she literally says, I don't know why we fight about. And she lists all these things I've been praying about. She lays back down. I don't say anything. I wake up the next day and I say, I'm going to follow Jesus. And she says, you're crazy. You're not a Catholic. You're the craziest person. I've you know, all these things to me. And I'm literally like, I'm going to follow God. If you care about the house, the cars, whatever, do it. In three weeks, she comes to faith. In three months, we're remarried. My son is 21. My daughter's 14. My other son's 11. So today, getting up out of a bed when I was sick the last few days, jumping on this with you. It's all about God, that's it. So that was the journey. He, he made himself known. And I say that to say this to people listening. Scientifically, your faith is always meant to be subjective. If I tell you I have five books in my hand, you can believe I don't, or you can believe I can. But until you look in my hand, you won't know. That's what I heard in the Bible, the good news of this coming Savior, this prophesied Messiah, the Gospels, the power and the salvation. Until you hear the good news, respond to the good news, can your eyes be opened? That was what I'd never heard. And I heard it, and it was the power and the salvation. 
And that's it. And those things in my life, that's as real as it gets. So yeah. Thank you, Jesus. So can I, can I, can I dial backwards a little bit yeah, on that? And probably because, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, um, so I'm curious cause like, you know, most, so like, you know, I've got, you know, I've been studying the Bible my whole life and, yeah. uh, degrees and was just about, you know, PhD in the Hebrew Bible, all these kind of things that I was, um, but what I found most people when they come to the Bible, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated book. Like it, the way you just laid it out, isn't the way it typically comes to somebody the first time they try to bite into it. Right. Well, so I'll tell you, so, so this yeah, is my question. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so I'm like, you're, so you have no religious background. It sounded like you're, you're, um, Suicidal. Your marriage. Oh yeah. Okay. So you're suicidal. I, and I, what, I'm not sure why, did you say you were come, you were, uh, uh, what were you saying about, um, you mentioned being under, were you arrested for something? Oh yeah. Probation? Yeah. 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 So yeah. just getting into fights and trouble and all the rest. Okay. Of it. Yeah. So your, your marriage is, has fallen apart. Yeah. You're suicidal. You've never read the Bible. You've never been in a church and you've never been in a church and you pick this Bible up on your own. Yeah. Like it just happened to be one of these ones you happen to lay around somewhere. No, we didn't have a Bible. Okay. So, yeah. I can, I can answer so that. You had to, we can go crazy. Yeah. So you, so you had to go buy a Bible or something or somebody gave well, you one. Well, part of the community service was <laughs> after reading the list of 200 places, the last list, it said Christian thrift store. If you go in my closet, you know what skaters wear? We wear plaid shirts because they're loose, but they're still warm enough. So I go to a Christian thrift store, not really knowing what it is. English people, we just think Catholic church. We think Irish and Scottish fighting. That's it. We think of the priest in Robin Hood. Right. I go to the Christian thrift store. I walk in. I saw the lights playing. And I'm like, what's going on? They tell me we will give you more hours if you start, and listen, I've already said, God, I'm going to prove you're not real before that even happened. And so I go into the thrift store and they say, hey, if you cook some of the burgers, which I couldn't cook burgers, I didn't care. I just, everywhere I went skating, they just handed you pizza and burgers anyway. If you cook burgers for the people in the church because they have a recovery ministry, we will give you extra hours. So while I'm cooking them, the pastor's preaching. So uh -huh. I'm hearing this, yeah, and I'm yeah. trying to disprove the Bible, and I'll say yeah. this to you, this is funny, <laughs> this is crazy, and I've shared this a couple times. I have, I don't have OCD now, but I had OCD so much then, I would do tricks like four or five times, so I just had them, like tennis players, it's rep repetition. So I was doing a trick on a handrail, kick the rail, hit between my legs, yes, hit between them, hit my head on the floor, and I sat up, and I said to my friends, I've seen God, and they all start laughing. And I start throwing up. And I can't remember this, but I remember being dizzy and sick. I said, I've seen God. My parents are out of town. The one night in my life they ever went out of town without us. And I must have been 14, 15. They call an ambulance. I go to the hospital. I don't know why they called an ambulance. I mean, maybe my friends could have drove me. I was that bad, staggering everywhere. I keep saying I've had an encounter with God. I wake up the next morning, I keep saying it. For the next two weeks, it's all I'm saying. And I have this crazy high and just this joy. I got in a fight with a kid on Friday in school, Mark Hanley. In school, he'd said something, I had buck teeth, went in the classroom, smacked him in the face. I'm going to do this to you after school. We get in a huge fight afterwards, pulls my shirt over, bites his hand, fighting, everything. I'm skating on Sunday when this happens. I go into school on Monday. After I've had this encounter that I claim is God, and I say, I don't know what it is. There was just this brightest light, and God told me. And I remember saying to everyone that was there over and over and over, he said, you're going to ride for Airwalk, you're going to live in America, and I've got a plan for your life. I wasn't sponsored to a degree. I was just getting things going. Airwalk was like this distant company. I go into school, see Mark Hanley, and went to fight again. Hey, I don't care about it. I encounter with God. And he's like, this is crazy. I was sitting there eating beans. And this is, this is a crazy interview. You played this for some guys who are high as a kite on a Friday night driving. They will be laughing their heads off. I hope to listen to this. What's up, guys? <laughs> I'm eating beans on toast in my house. And my mom's sitting there and I go, isn't God good? And for two weeks, I keep talking about how good God is. Why am I bringing this up to you? 
because I got sponsored by Airwalk. I lived in America and God has a plan for my life. But I remember your point where you're like, how do we get here? You asked me if I read a Bible. I opened the Bible at that stage. I went upstairs and grabbed the Bible. The first word in the Bible, you know what I read? Tabarnacle. Do you know what a tabar- <laughs> Do you know what a tabarnacle is? You do. It's a tabernacle. I read to Barnacle. I put it down and said, this is not for me. Yeah, yeah. That was when I was right. 15. Yeah. When I came to faith. That's, so that's, that. a lot of people have those experiences if they've never had any background with the never. Bible. They pick but it up, they start crazy. to read it, and then it's like, what? How do they but make I, sense of this thing, right? But I ignored the feeling. <laughs> I pushed this feeling away. It was gone in two weeks. This high that I had. When I came to faith, someone said, Brian, explain it to me. And I'd been interviewed in magazines where I'd said, I got knocked out when I was a kid and I I had an encounter that I I can only say was God. I knew it was God. And I had friends to this day who said, man, we read that and we were praying for you. When I came to faith, this feeling I had in the room, it's 20 feet away, which is my my son's room now. I was telling someone the only way I can explain it and the same feeling came back like, Brian, that was what happened in your life. And I broke down in tears. And it was like, to me, I had no religious understanding. I had no real bias. I had an opinion, but reading through, and let's get back to your point because I'm sure you're going to go somewhere. You take on 66 books of the Bible, the Hebrew, the twisted stories, yeah. the craziness yeah. of man. Right. It's bizarre. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. And I, you know, um, I have, you know, there's been some interesting stories. Like I remember Nikki Gummel, you know, who yeah, yeah, yeah. found his alpha. alpha. Yeah. yeah. And he was an atheist and he, he had friends that were trying to, you know, get him to follow Jesus or whatever. And so he, he started reading the Bible just to disprove it. Yeah. And he's one of the few guys, and of course he was a lawyer at the time and he read the thing straight wow. through like front that. to back all the way through, like all night long. That's crazy. And toward the end of reading the Bible through for the first time to disprove God, he came to faith, yeah. which I've hardly ever there's very few, like I, yeah. like, look, I've, I've been doing Jesus yeah. stuff all around the world on continents yeah. all over the world. I yeah. rarely found stories where people just yeah. with no religious background started reading the Bible and that was got it. through it and actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. actually had a positive yeah. encounter. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it, <laughs> yeah. like I would have people come to my church who'd never had any back. They start reading the Bible and they're like, oh, what is going on? Yeah, God, yeah. Like God's yeah. having, you know, <laughs> these people kill these people. What the yeah. hell? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's the, that's the I thing. always said, always said when I was preaching, I said, have you ever read the Bible? There's some crazy stuff in that yeah. book, you know? <laughs> I know. Well, you, well, you know, you put God with man. And even this point, you know, you think about people killing people, God makes a promise to Israel. It's like me telling you, I'm going to send you to Liverpool with a letter from my dad. I've made the promise to you, so you're safe, but it's really my promise about what's in that envelope. You go outside today, airplane falls down about to hit you. I have to stop the plane because of my promise to you. Terrorists come to kill you. I have to stop the terrorists because my promise that's in you. So you look at Israel and the history of that, the Amalekites, the Philistines, all the rest, constantly opposing God's people who God has said, these are my people. They're rejecting their ways. There's grace for a season. And then you know what? I got to do away with people. And that's, that's like terrorists today. We don't oppose what's happening when people are slaying people, but we put such a heavy judgment on God in the old Testament. We're like, Hey, you know, in the end of the book's way worse. Revelation's going to be way worse than what we see in the old Testament. I mean, it's the ultimate. So yeah. <laughs> so you, so you, when you were at the thrift store though, to go back there, you were, you were hearing like, even though you didn't have, you'd had this one experience with God as a kid that was yeah. really real, but then you kind of let it go of it. Yeah. So I then all the, about it. yeah. Then all these years later, you're at this thrift store and you're hearing this mm-hmm. all of a sudden you're hearing the pastor, somebody's handing you a Bible. You're starting to yeah piece this thing together Yep. And then you come back to this house where you're at right now. Yep. And you have a, a you have another encounter. That I had a lot. I had a lot of, I'll tell you, this is what's crazy. I, I should have got this. It's in the garage. I was walking from my house to the beach and I'm walking down the beach and I heard the pastor preach, get your, get your own Bible. And I'm walking down the beach to, towards the beach from this park, Lake park. And I'm like, I need a Bible. I need, I'm like, Lord, I need a Bible. 
and I just said that, and I wasn't a Christian, I was just saying this. On my life, I walk up to the wooden bench that is on Lake Park, and there's a over, it must have been $34, probably at the time, probably 50 bucks today, the thickest NLT Bible wrapped in cling film sitting on the bench. I picked it up and I couldn't believe it. And I walked down to the beach with it, and I came home, got a pink highlighter, and that's the Bible I highlighted to disprove, to disprove. And I haven't looked at it in years. Hmm. On the podcast, I was talking about it, and I should have it to show you, because who knows? I could probably write a book based on what I had problems with then and give the answers today. Mm -hmm. But I've never found the Bible. You'll see Gideon Bibles in hotels, and you'll see sure. Bibles thrown. This was like, it's like getting a brand new ESV or something today. It was like... Right. <laughs> the looks and, and it's literally it was sitting on my coffee table for years till like yeah. you know wet wore it out but i had these very spiritual experiences which when you think about it biblically that's how god moved and spoke and i get the canons closed so is jesus going to show up in your living room i don't look at it that way but i'm saying i think god does do things still he still impresses upon people he still moves in that way yeah. you know for nikki to read that and the other thing is the word of god's anointed the spirit mm -hmm. of god is there there's truth in it his word goes out and doesn't return void so you know, we act like he won't do this. Like you said about pe people in England. Well, are people going to respond? Well, we're not waiting on the Holy Spirit. He's waiting on us. He's already out doing ministry. We're on a call, a great commission. We're not sitting back saying, you know, help me decorate my house. God's sovereign. I get it. But we're so focused internally. But when we're living this mission, he's already the one going. So he does things like that. So, yeah. yeah so, um so you have this encounter, your marriage is falling apart. You have a kid. Yeah. But then you, you really surrender your life to Jesus. Mm. And three weeks later, am I catching that right? Three weeks yeah. later, your yeah. ex-wife. a lot of stuff, but yeah, you got that part. Yeah. Three weeks later, your ex-wife is our, is coming to Jesus. She was she, like, whatever's happened to Brian, and, something's happened. Yeah. I'm Catholic. So, she's thinking. Yeah. So this so this marriage that only lasted less than a year, mm, two years, yeah, is yeah. is being put back together. Oh yeah, and we were separated for. So we got married in in ninety nine. Began to kind of talk about divorce a year and a half, two years in. I just looked the other day because I was doing something for my daughter and found the certificates. We were separated for four to five years. But she had the mindset where she was raised by Italian parents. She's Mexican, Italian, and Native American. So she's thinking, and they would say this, you know, Brian's just like Hitler or someone. He's just him, you know, because we fought like crazy. She thought, oh, he's just one of those guys. Everyone thinks their ex is like Hitler. She's like, him and Hitler are probably the only people going to hell. She's the Catholic. So now I'm waking up in the morning talking about Jesus, and she's like, you're not even <laughs> baptized. You don't even go to church. And I'm like, babe, and she's been watching me read the Bible. I am just religiously getting involved in everything. And she starts saying, I'm the one who's a Catholic. I'm the one who's a believer, right? She had had a boyfriend on the East Coast who was a part of all these hardcore bands, you know, music bands. And they would kind of get into like those chants where you, you know, the mantras and all this stuff, the Buddhism and guys like, is it Ray Capo and like Seffler and H2O and some of those bands. It was popular in the straight edge scene. And mm -hmm. she started to feel guilty about that. She'd be flying home and she'd think, God, um, don't let the plane go down. I'm sorry I keep doing all these weird things with these people. And then when she meets me, we just let all that go. Now I'm the Christian in this house, walking around, praying, playing like, you know, what was the music? And they, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, you know, open up the gates and all these songs that you know. <laughs> and she's like thinking, who is this guy? He likes Iron Maiden, the Misfits, the Ramones. <laughs> now you're listening to all this, you know, contemporary Christian worship. And, yeah, yeah. and so she starts getting convicted. And so she's like an introvert and she's like, she goes to the church and she says, God, I am not going down to an altar. I'm not going and responding to some altar thing. A guy from like, not YWAM, what's that big one that started like David Wilkerson and Leonard Ravenhill? Why am I forgetting the name of it? Um, you know, that huge music. Youth with a mission, maybe? Youth with a mission. So uh -huh. someone from that like comes mm -hmm. in to speak and has never spoke at the church. It's in a college that the church is renting. There's over 400 people. The pastor doesn't know you from me. Or it might have been Teen Challenge. It was, it was, you know what? Yeah, it Teen was, Challenge. It went yeah, yeah, yeah. the West Coast one. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. 
Um, big gentleman Ron, Pastor Ron, black gentleman <clears throat> sang and everything, and he's just preaching, and she's praying the whole time, I want what Brian has. She's praying the whole time, Jesus, I believe this, but I am not, because he, he did an altar call, sometimes people do, they don't. He doesn't, he only knows the pastor, he has no idea. She's sitting there, he gets done and tells this lady that's friends of ours, the Lord wants me to pray with her. She mm. needs to come to faith, which again, where are you going to go with your theology? We can dissect this, you know, all the rest of it. She has been praying though. I want to hear your voice, God. I believe this. She goes down, has this engagement, this prayer, totally blown away. And then her life shook and then we're married and life's changed. And mm. yeah, we prayed on the bed this morning right here. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. So, um, so you guys have, I mean, you, you've been following Jesus now for almost two decades. Am I right? 20 Since years? 2000, almost? August, 2004. I think I came to okay. faith. So between then yeah, and September. So almost almost yeah. 20 years. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. like, so are you in like, are like, what's your, what's your world like? How, how, how long did you do the skateboard world? Yeah. Yeah. And then so, where did you move from, from that world to now? Like get us, get us to now. <laughs> yeah, no, believe me. I mean, and these are the, you know, these are the interesting questions to set up things for you because again, you're skating six hours a day. You and yeah. me, this is all we're doing, but see what was God going to focus on my marriage? So immediately I was like, okay, I got to focus on my marriage. So they got involved in a church here called the sanctuary. <laughs> The sanctuary where Christian Asoy was a part of, you know, Jay Adams, a lot of skaters, different people like that. Um, really responding and coming to faith there, I would say. I'm starting to go a couple times a week. I'm meeting with people more. And I'm thinking, okay, Lord, what do I do? Like, you know, I'm an, I know I'm your workmanship, but how do I live this out? What does it mean? That church was a heavy recovery church. So from that, you got guys like Stephen Baldwin, who now had come to faith, and he's trying to do all these Christian events. You got Brian Welch, a singer, you know, with a guitarist for Corn. You've got Luis Palau and Franklin Graham. You know, you can ask Matt right here. I spoke in like interviews, but I had like a crazy accent, swore like a sailor. And I was more like, leave me alone. I loved people. And I, I've always kind of been, I guess you'd say like a teacher, pastor kind of person. Where I wanted to help kids skate. I was so thankful. You know what I mean? That skating almost took me out of like what would have been a crazy life of partying, drugs. I probably would have been dead. I mean, my friends in Liverpool, it's crazy how deep they got into things in prison. So I was always thankful, but I'm getting invited to these events to speak. And I'm like, what, what am I doing? And the church was very ev evangelistic. So they're just like, yeah, know your testimony, share your story. So I start doing this. Then you've got like things like the 700 club and I am second and all these ministries. And you know, I'm in town and you're like, I don't know who this skater is, but I'm going to interview him. Hey, Brian, here's five questions, 10 minutes before the church service. But it ministers to people, you know, you can then build off on the marriage and the rest. So mm -hmm. I start doing that. I do some minor Bible schools while I'm there at the church. Like, I think it was even like an Oral Roberts one or like Kenneth Hagin. It was almost like a word of faith church at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just start reading and studying myself. Interviews become about my faith. I start, you know, putting graphics on my skateboards that relate to what God has done in my life, which which was just, it's just me outward processing. We're like artists, you know, skaters always do that with right. what they're into. Definitely. And then I get invited places, speak more places. It grows and grows and grows. And then before long, churches are like, hey, do you want to share more of a message? Do you want to do this and do that? That's kind of been my life since then. Okay. And, in 2000, and so I wrote a book on marriage through a lot of friends struggling. I was like, man, if I could just give them, like you said, you know, to read through the Bible and you yourself and sit there and find every nugget on marriage, Google could help you. But if I could hand you something that's 100 pages that you can get yeah. through in 30 days and really drive some things home, that came out of it. A lot of podcast things came out of it. And now I do a lot of just traveling ministry i get invited to go speak and share and actually go into other countries like you know costa rica and do missions trips and mm -hmm. that's it I, just, yeah. I guess you'd say i'm more of an evangelist as in i don't set a schedule i get invited to do stuff i partner with churches right. and i go in and teach at times at churches as well so yeah yeah awesome man yeah <laughs> yeah well it's pretty crazy uh, yeah it is it is you know i i I was, you know, connected with this movement called Vineyard and yeah, of course. Uh, worked with them for almost 30 years Yeah, and planted, planted churches all over, you mm -hmm. know, four different continents and yeah. 
So I've done, done a lot of work. In fact, I was, I was just in Ethiopia back in October mm. and uh, the guy that I'd helped start the, I was a part of helping start that move the vineyard. We've got yeah. about 28 churches in Ethiopia now and wow. I'd help and help do a, three or four orphanages over there. And wow. the guy that heads up the movement over there said, Hey, would you do a little pastor's deal for us? Cause I haven't really been doing uh, yeah. speak since all I've gone through. I haven't really, I've been working mostly in the recovery world for the last, yeah. uh, uh, two and That's a half thriving years. Thriving now. That's thriving now. If you can, well, it's there. been, it's been a really, uh, I'm really thankful for that, for that community and pretty yeah, networked man. here in Kansas city. And then, started this podcast and all of that, but, uh, yeah, I'm so, I'm so, uh, uh it's fun to hear your story. You know, it's funny. Cause I was, I was into rock climbing. I started rock climbing when I was 16. Crazy. And I, didn't I was around as much, you know, cause I, it's well, there, like this was way years. before there were, this was, this was in the seventies. So this is when it was a actual rock. really, really fringe yeah. crowd, you know? And, uh, people way outside the norm, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, and it wasn't, it was a long time before there were rock climbing walls and gyms and all that I was kind of saying, stuff. The plastic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, now, and then, and then I still do competitive cycling. And like I told you, I just mountain biking in the snow and ice a few weeks ago and just blew out my shoulder. So, uh, That's so I, good. I, I've always had a, affinity yeah. for people that are into, you know, what yeah. we might call extreme sports. Yeah. You know, when you do it, you don't really think about it being extreme, do you? But no. other, other people watch it and they think <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. It is like, you know, skating is jumping down stuff all day. I mean, you mentioned rock climbing and I'm uh-huh. like, and I get why your cuffs and all the rest. I mean, that could have been an injury from years ago that just got a, you know, weak. And then you mentioned what modus, mo, um, Mountain biking, mountain biking and crashing. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, literally yeah. last week seen like four or five horrendous mountain bike slams. And in my head, I'm like, why do people do this? And I know people watch skating thinking, why do you do that? Yeah. Or they watch you do jujitsu, but why do you do it? But you know, <laughs> you know, as a man, when you get to 35, 40, it's almost therapeutic that our bodies need to just keep going. My dad had a stroke and it wasn't a stroke to mess with him is that he didn't do anything afterwards. And he's like, Brian, I'm going crazy. He had to start gardening or something. So, yeah. I mean, you probably look the way you do because you do so much stuff, you know, I mean, I'm well, the en- my- I, yeah. it's like mental health for me. The endorphins that come from just yeah. like I do, I do endurance stuff. Like I've done, I even do long grab like gravel road racing. I've done mm-hmm. 200 mile one day gravel road races and stuff like that. And, Pretty but yeah, cool. it's uh it's definitely, a mental health thing for me. And yep. then I, you know, and then it's a community of people that you connect with and get to know and, yeah. and hang out. And, and we always, you know, f- with me, everybody knows I've been a pastor and then I do spirituality adventure. So I'm always having spiritual conversations with people. Yeah. You well, know? you're a well, they can and, pull on where I could say, Hey, what about this? What about this? And that, that table, if you like sitting there, I mean, that's yeah. what most people don't have. This yeah. is unbiased. Otherwise, that's amazing. <laughs> At any rate, man, it's good to talk with you. Thank you for uh, of jumping on this thing. So how would people connect with you? What uh, what's the best ways? What's your website? What's your Instagram, Facebook? What's all yeah, that stuff? Just Brian Sumner.net is the website. Someone is at cybersquatting.com for some reason, but I like net. It's a little bit more evangelistic, you know, and then just Brian Sumner on Instagram. There's only a photo of me with my wife or something. And, and that's it. You know, I do the podcast foolishness when I get round to it because I'm so busy doing other stuff. And then put that book out, never fails. And then I normally respond to anything people message me. Even if I miss it, I'll try and go back because I look at it like you could be messaging me tonight because you're suicidal or because you're marriage. And if I can just give you 10 minutes or drop a verse or send you a link, especially with the world today, I mean, you know, you, you might even, I'm sure you don't, but almost lightly think, wow, you know, I'm. I'm doing all these sports activities, but you are placed in these people's lives because you have in you what's in you. You know, the Apostle Paul knew what he knew and God used them. So just our being able to be a light with what's been sown into us and reach people and just, just point to him. That's all it is. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and your so the book is called never so book, fails, never fails. Like love never fails. And it's yeah. like a 30 day devotion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's on Amazon. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, that's great, man. Thank you so much.
Appreciate course. it. Anytime, yeah. Yeah. Do you still skate at all? I do. You know, I go. All my kids are way more athletic than me. Like, yeah. Surf, what do they do? Surf, skate, jujitsu. Okay. But I'll go skate around town with them. And I mean, my oldest played baseball. And he was the tiniest kid, but the all star catcher. And I, I, I learned about baseball through him, you know, and that right there is how I throw a knuckleball if I had the right nails. <laughs> and I fell in love with it. But um, yeah, I mean, that's, I skate around a bit. I just, I might skate downtown today if I'm going to eat, but I don't want to get hurt skating. So I, <laughs> so I can't do jujitsu. That's no. it. I love jujitsu. And, you know, and, and like, like, like the bubble you're in with people, like a family, mm-hmm. jujitsu is like, you can do that until yeah. you're 90. Um, I'm surprised you, you've never tried it, huh? Never have. I, you know, I, I wrestled when I was a kid, like in gym class. Yeah. And I sucked at it. So I just think that I, I've never, and then I, I've never really been a fighter. Like, like I was always like, I was the thing that I was good at in high school was distance running. So I was a half mile or miler. So you ran away from the fight. Yeah. I would just like, if I can just get a head start on you, I know you'll never catch me, you know? So, <laughs> but not being a fighter, <laughs> but so not being a fighter, what's going to happen to you if you, get, if you get confronted by someone, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I did take two years of karate in, at Baylor where I went to college. So I, I have a few moves, you know, like, but I've never, honestly i i think i'm a bit of a pacifist so like i like i would be like trying to figure out yeah how to (laughs) how to have jesus bail me out of this fight you know like (laughs) diffuse the situation exactly yeah well you know to your point i I sit with a lot of people who go through craziness as well one of the guys that was part of our church was a a high level black belt he said brian you got to just start rolling I lost audio. Hey, we lost audio. Wonder what happened there. Oh, now he froze up. Are you back? Okay. There you go. We lost you for about two or three minutes. So you were getting ready to say something about a friend that's a black belt? Yeah, it said it's unstable. You hear me okay now? Yeah. Yeah, so let me just jump right in real quick. Yeah. Yeah, just start where you're the black belt comment. So even a church, you know, I'm around a guy that's a high level black belt, fought all over the world, amazing man. And he's like, Brian, as skating slowed down, you're sitting with couples who are divorced, kids who are, you know, suicidal. I'm carrying that. That's you and me, our conversation every day. And he said, you need to just come get on the mats at the gym. And like you said, using the body, it's a vehicle, it's therapeutic. So that's where jujitsu came from. You know, you'll go sit with these guys in their 40s. At the end of class, they don't know God. They're sitting there depressed because of what's going on with their wife or they've got an addiction or they're just angry. They'll sit and talk with you and converse. So for me, it's like therapy. The Bible talks about using the physical side of your mm-hmm. body. So, yeah. but I'm telling you this, it's not like wrestling. If you're athletic, go find, just 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 to honor Brian, just say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to goof off and text him. Go take a class because because it's once not I get my you. shoulder fixed up here. I yeah. was thinking that. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. telling you, if you're limber and lean and you start doing stuff, but you'll get addicted. So yeah, yeah. you know, there's I've got some friends that were into the MMA scene here in Kansas City. And yeah. There's a dude named Lee Gibson that uh, special forces, and then he was mm. pretty well known. He's yeah, fought, like 15, 20 years ago, he fought some big names in the MMA wow. world and all that stuff. And yeah, so I do have friends in that that arena, you know, that are still at it. You know, I love it. That's my vice. Yeah. Yeah. MMA is my vice for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for everybody for tuning into spirituality adventures and we'll see you next time. Thanks you guys. This concludes today's episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Remember if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Remember to like share or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using. And then go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com and make a one-time donation, or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content. Thanks so much.